Hello, my name is Carl Niji, and I am the owner operator of a business called Overcoming Dyslexia, ADD, ADHD, and Learning Disabilities in Ottawa, Canada. I'm what's known as a Davis facilitator, and today this is the third video in a series of videos that I've uh, titled The Elephant in the Room. Um, today what, what I'm going to discuss is an, an elephant that comes along that I think people are discounting or not even understanding. And I think when I explained this elephant to people in my office, particularly parents, they didn't even know it was a thing. Uh, so I think in some ways it's a very small elephant that people overlook, but in a, from another point of view, it is actually a massive elephant and it is one of the major problems that education is facing when it comes to trying to help people with um, learning disabilities or dyslexia or any type of literacy um, difficulty that that person might be having. So um, this, this pink elephant uh, doesn't really have a name unto itself, but the question was posed to me by a little girl many years ago. Her name was Fiona. She was a very bright child of nine years old and she had been diagnosed with ADD. She was definitely having problems with reading, in particularly what she was uh, recalling once she'd read it. Very often she could read every word on the page, so people thought there were no problems with her reading. But what she was struggling to do was remember what she was reading, think with it, and then communicate it to another person. So she had a lot of focusing difficulties and recalling and just sort of really finishing her work in school was her problem. But when we took a close look, or when I took a close look, what I found is, is that she had problems with trigger words and she was not reading at grade level. She was at least a year below. So she was nine years old and in grade three and reading at about mm, a very wobbly grade two. We had a fantastic program and she did extremely well. She's gone on and finished her trigger words. And as far as I know, she's doing really well in school. In the middle of our program, Fiona stopped and looked up at me and we were in the middle of doing a reading exercise, actually. And she looked up at me and said, Carl, who invented reading? And the look on her face was absolutely priceless. It was like she wanted to take this person to one side and give them a really good talking to because she was finding it difficult to do and everybody in her life was saying it was easy. When we look at the educational systems that we've got around the world and if we look at the history of education, the def there's a definite impression that you get that literacy is simple and easy for people to do and you should be able to do it. And if you can't, there's something wrong with you or you're maybe just being lazy. Um, that is something that's really come down from history, through history, and I like to think of it as actually academic snobbery, but that's actually um, a term that I'll use later on uh, in another video. But really the impression that you get definitely if you're somebody that can't do it, if you're dyslexic, is that reading is really easy and you should be able to do this thing, where actually in reality, the opposite is true. However, uh, Fiona's question still stands, who invented reading? And that's really an, a, an elephant in the room. So we have to actually go back through history. Um, and if we look from, particularly from a Eurocentric point of view, which is what we're gonna look at realistically, um, we find that nobody in Europe invented reading. Even though we're using a Greek Roman alphabet, as we call it, it wasn't the Greeks or the Romans that invented um, reading or writing. We can even go back to Egypt, uh, which is one of the things that Fiona pointed out when she talked about hieroglyphs. And I said, well, that's very close to who invented it, but not quite. We have to go back a little bit further to a country right next door to Egypt, which is modern day Iraq and Iran. Now, Egypt, Iraq, and Iran were part of what used to be known as the Fertile Crescent. It's no longer that fertile, but it was uh, about five and a half thousand years ago. And in modern day Iraq, uh, there was a place that used to be called Mesopotamia, and the people that used to live there were Sumerians. Now, the ancient Sumerians, as far as we know, from an archaeological point of view, they were the ones that really invented reading and writing. Um, but the question then still stands as to why. 
did they invent it? And what was the need? Well, we have to think of reading and writing and, and literacy in general like um, any other skill. Like if you sort of pull back and take yourself out of the big discussion as what works and what doesn't work. If you pull back and you look at it, you realize that it is a skill that was developed for a purpose by a certain group of people. So in the same way that people who developed uh, blacksmithing, um, they, they needed metal tools and then they could use those metal tools to do woodworking. And the people that were good at woodworking developed woodworking as a skill set. A really good example is actually music. Uh, adults developed music and they developed musical instruments. So if we think of literacy as an adult skill, we have to look back in history and say, well, who invented it and why? As uh, civilization is beginning to get bigger in uh, ancient Samaria, what actually happened, sorry, in ancient Mesopotamia, what actually happened is you had very small groups of people living together in smaller groups than tribes in a very fertile area that was easily uh, easy to build and farm and grow crops in. As those groups of people get bigger and you go from a small group to a, a tribe with a tribal leader, that tribe then goes to a small village with maybe some village elders. That village then grows to a city with uh, basically a system of sort of local government. And as this keeps on getting bigger, you get a separation of people who are sort of running society and people are out there doing the day-to-day -day work. This eventually turns into kingdoms. And if you look back at ancient Mesopotamia, what you find is, is there were uh, small city states that turned into kingdoms. And some of these cities were, they think, somewhere between about 10,000 people all the way up to maybe 50,000 people. And then they, they sprung up along these rivers, uh, the river of Tigris and Euphrates, because these whole valleys were very fertile places. And eventually you end up with just one king sort of ruling the whole place or various kings at different times. So that still doesn't really tell us who invented it or why though. But as you see society growing and more and more people, you end up realizing that there is somebody at the top, like a king who's sort of in charge and everybody else is doing the work. It's sort of like a layered cake. Well, right below the layer, uh, right below the king is a layer that we call administration. And when we look at reading and writing, the first records that we see from that time, we see that they were actually administration letters. They were basically uh, a way of communicating and administrating society. Um, and this is what you see when you look back at ancient records of, at the time, what they used to call cuneiform. So the ancient Sumerians, first of all, started with a uh, pictorial language. So if you had a little uh, something that represented food, it was a little stalk of wheat. If you had a man, it was a little man. And eventually these pictograms, which in Egypt were like hieroglyphs, these pictograms got more and more stylized until one whole little symbol represented the, the whole word. And then these got simplified into what we now know is cuneiform. And cuneiform looked like this. This is the letter A in cuneiform or cuneiform. And this is the modern day equivalent, A. And this basic idea of a symbol representing a sound, A or A, and then that those symbols being strung together to make words like cat or dog. And this is how writing developed and how reading developed. But that still doesn't really tell us why. It really was for administrative purposes about five and a half thousand years ago. You don't see works of literature until about a thousand years later with books like, uh, or a poem like uh, Gilgamesh, which is about 4,000 years ago. What's interesting from that time is that a king from the very early times wrote in sort of like on a, one of these clay tablets that they used to write on, that he had been taught the secret and sacred art of cuneiform, of reading and writing. Well, this tells us a lot about who invented it. It was um, secretive, so we don't want everybody to know how to do it, and it was sacred. So you end up with church and state, basically the people, that, the pillars that are holding up society and basically running society, those are the two groups of people that are actually being taught how to read and write. But again, that really doesn't tell us who. 
when we really take a good long hard look, what we realize is that this skill is an adult skill that was developed by adults for adults who, who could think this way simply and easily. So if you could read and write simply and easily, if you were higher up in society and you were trusted and you were probably part of the church as well, then you would be taught how to read and write because they needed you in this administration class, in effect. That stays that way for almost five and a half thousand years. Uh, if you go through history, you see that there are times when uh, there was a lot of literacy and then there wasn't very much literacy. So in the Roman period, there was a, a lot of literacy. However, it was mainly men were educated. Um, to read and write. It was also a military structure, so there, that's an organisational skill that's needed within the military. And then after the sort of collapse of the Roman Empire, you see very low levels of literacy. And then you see examples of this with uh, Alfred the Great in England, who when he inherited his uh, kingdom, he realised that when he looked around at his courtiers, the knights and the lords, he realised that they were illiterate. He himself was illiterate. He used to uh, actually be accompanied by a monk who used to do all of his reading and writing for him. And he established uh, re or re-established reading and writing in English society. And this is why he's called Alfred the Great, because he established weights and measures. And he also re-established uh, literacy in England. Um, amongst the ruling classes. And if you come through history, it isn't until the Industrial Revolution that that changes. So we have a small group of adults reading and writing. And it isn't until the Industrial Revolution that there is an expansion. There's two things happening. One is that the Industrial Revolution is happening and there's a lot more mechanization. And secondly, there's colonial expansion around the world by European countries. And this means that this thin class or this small group of people who are administrating society has to grow. You also see an expansion of the middle class during the Industrial Revolution as well. Um, and it isn't until the, almost the end of the Industrial Revolution that we see reading and writing being given to children en masse. And this is really significant because when we start doing that, um, at the end of the Industrial Revolution, the child labour laws came in, so you could know children were no longer used as a labour force. Uh, so there was a lot of children, to childhood delinquency on the streets. And in places like London, they were actually getting riots uh, between, between, with kids had nothing to do. So at that same time, they basically introduced the school system. And we started to teach everybody basic literacy on, and numeracy and other skills as well. And it also gave somewhere for kids to go when the adults were all in work in the factories. So as soon as we start to do that, what happens is um, the first learning disability gets coined by a gentleman called Rudolf Berlin. Now, I actually wrongly named him Gustav Berlin in another video, but his name was Rudolf Berlin, and that was in 1887, 135 years ago. And he coined the first uh, learning disabilities, sort of uh, the mother of all learning disabilities, which is dyslexia. S the next step that happens in this is, um, so we, we introduce reading and writing en masse to, to children. We start seeing that some of them can't do it so well and we start getting the first term, the first learning disability term comes along, dyslexia in uh, 133 years, 135 years ago. Then 87 years ago, we then get the first standardized remedial um, way of trying to help people with a Dr. Autumn and Dr. Gillingham. They got together in uh, the 1930s and they developed this method that we now call Autumn Gillingham. And that's about 87 years ago. And all other sort of remedial methods have spun off of that in effect. Uh, and so then the next step that we see that's really significant after that is uh, MRI scanning shows up about 45 years ago in the 1970s. And this is the first time that we can actually look at live brains, 
under imagery and see what parts of the brain light up when people try to read and write and these sorts of things and other sort of conditions of the brain. But 45 years ago, that was in its infancy. But even though those that technology is expanding and getting better and is a pretty amazing technology, it still doesn't answer the question, what is at cause and what is causing the dyslexia or any other of these learning disabilities. So when we recap then, when we look at this, if we really reduce it down, what we realize is, is that reading and writing, or literacy, is an adult skill. It was developed by adults, for adults, over the last five and a half thousand years, and it was never intended to be given to children. As soon as we start giving it to children, 133 years ago, we start seeing the first terms of learning disabilities getting coined. Then eight, uh, 80, almost 90 years ago, we see the first real remedial method coming along, trying to help people that this whole thing of literacy isn't really working for. Then what we see with modern day brain scanning is, well, actually a lot of people can't do this, particularly children. They can't do it as easily as we think they can. And statistically, when you actually look statistically, how many people actually are at full uh, grade 12 literacy level when they leave school, it's actually really surprising, those numbers. And we'll look at that in another video. What the MRI scanning really showed us and sort of dispelled this idea of that reading is actually really simple and easy and everybody should be able to do it, is the scanning of the brain. And when we look back historically, what we realize is that, is that fully developed adult brains that probably didn't have any kind of learning disability developed this thing called reading and writing. And the brain of an adult is quite different from the brain of a child. Developmentally, they're not in the same place. A six, seven, eight, nine, even a 10 year old isn't, doesn't have the same kind of brain as a fully developed adult without learning problems. <laughs> And what we're trying to do is essentially uh, take an adult skill and try and force children to learn it. And the reason I use the word force is it really is like this old saying, trying to jam a round peg through a square hole. And what we find is it just mangles the peg. And I was really quite shocked when I realized this um, and I sort of first discovered this and began to really think through it. But I think most people miss this elephant in the room because you have to take a very long look at history and a very detailed look and you could make an hour long documentary just on this one subject. So the real takeaway or the elephant in the room is that this thing that we call literacy um, that was developed by adults for adults, uh, as soon as we start giving it to children is when all the problems kick off. And in particularly in the last 50 years, ever really since we've had MRI scans, um, we've discovered a lot more about the brain, a lot more about learning disabilities. And you also see there is this explosion in so-called learning disabilities or that term that we use. There are actually over 70 different types of learning disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health. And it sort of fluctuates, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But that is a remarkable number that have come along in the last sort of 50 years. And I think that this is one of the major problems in trying to help people with uh, learning challenges in school, that we're trying to actually get them to do something, particularly children, that their brains aren't ready for. And when you sit and think about that for a moment, it's kind of obvious. You go like, oh God, yeah, right. Why didn't someone tell me this years ago? But the problem is, is that the school systems around the world have this one way of teaching people to read. It's historically, it's come down from literally from antiquity. It kind of works for people. It kind of doesn't work for people. Uh, it really works for some small groups. And we're gonna look at that in another video, just how many people it really does work for when we think of it as working versus not working. And it's actually really not quite the whole picture of what we're being presented is a partial picture. So the school system or this paradigm that we find ourselves stuck in is really, this is the way it should be done. We have this A plan, and if you don't fit into this A plan, well, that's kind of too bad for you because we don't have a B plan. The only B plan we've got is to slightly modify the A plan, and that's all this remedial method that we've had for about 
80, 90 years, and statistically, it doesn't seem to work so well. Um, when we pull back and look at the Davis method, what we realize is two fundamental things. The first thing is what I discussed in the last video. Ron discovered what is at the root cause of dyslexia, ADD, ADHD, etc., what we call learning disabilities. The second is he went on then and said, well, and developed methods that made it easier and simpler for those people with those so-called learning disabilities to be able to learn to read in a simpler, easier way. And actually, uh, when we give this method to people who are not dyslexic, they actually learn to read even a bit quicker. And there's a really wonderful example of a school in New Zealand that did this. They adopted the Davis method into the school system and they ended up with a very high level of lit literacy very quickly. And we'll just talk about that in another video. So the pink elephant uh, this uh, week is really reading and writing is an adult skill. It was developed by adults for adults and it was never intended to be given to children. The educational system now though is stuck with this method. It doesn't really have a B plan, it just has an A plan. And what I am encouraging people to do, if you haven't realized it already, is to go and look at the Davis method. And that's what I really call the Davis plan. It is a simple, easy way of helping children to learn to read, write and spell at grade level. And um, this is why I and many other Davis facilitators try to promote it and use it for ourselves. So that's it for today. If you'd like to continue this conversation with me, you certainly can. Uh, you can go to my website, which will be below. The best thing to do if you're not in Ottawa, Canada, is go to the main Davis website, which will be again listed below, and find the nearest Davis facilitator to you and discuss the difficulties that you might be having with that person, and then they can help you and match the, the best Davis program to the difficulties that you're having. Uh, please uh, like, share and subscribe because it does actually, or at least just give it a thumbs up because it does um, help promote um, on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, so that's it for now and I'll see you in the next video.